A uh, very good afternoon to you once again. Good to see you all back again here uh, for the third of our four instalments of the World Builders uh, Design in, in, in um, Film and Game Design connected to our fantasy exhibition, which is on its last weekend over in the main building. Um, and welcome to everybody who's joining us online today. So today, the session, we're going to focus on AI, uh, the big what if, if this one has been framed as. So that's uh, uh, going to be chaired by our special guest, uh, Robbie Stamp, uh, who uh, may be known to some of you already, but uh, he was uh, the business partner of the and friend of the late, great Douglas Adams, uh, an, ex an executive producer on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy movie in times gone by, and currently does many things, including running what is called the AI Goosebumps Club, which he'll probably tell you about. So enjoy the session. There'll be a chance for questions later on. And please, if you're watching online, put your questions in the form below the video window. And enjoy. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so before um, I ask our two panellists here, I just want to... Um, Irenison Okaji was due to be here today. Um, she can't be here because uh, her mother has been taken very ill. So what I thought I would just do... I only discovered this this week, to my shame. I'm just going to read, just very quickly, from uh, her most recent collection of short stories. Uh, just the very, very beginning, uh, and a line that I thought was just absolutely stunning. And it'll be, I'm partly doing it, sort of, uh, because it's a shame Irenison can't be here, and we had a lovely chat this week, and she was looking forward to it hugely. Partly because I think it'll speak to what is going to be one of the big themes that we're wanting to, to explore in a conversation today, uh, which is around the relationship between human embodiment and sense-making, our bodies and how they move through time and space, our memories, the relationship, the emerging relationship with artificial intelligence, thinking about what it is and what it isn't. Um, and uh, there was just a beautiful line that, that uh, gave me real goosebumps when I read it. Um, so it's from her short story called Logarithm. And I'm only going to read a few lines. Um, here is a skillet. Here is a loaf of rye bread. Here is a river. Here are two reflections for it. Here is a chintz skirt. Here is a rib on a bend. Here is a dawn carrying December. I just thought that was a genius line. Absolutely genius. You can read entire novels and there's not a single zinger in the, the whole novel. Not one line. The story might carry you through, but there's not a single line that makes you go, oh, that's beautiful. And I think that line, here is a dawn carrying December, is very beautiful. So, because Ian Renison couldn't be here, I just thought I'd start that way. So, without further ado then, we'll get on. I will say a little bit about myself after the panellists just briefly introduce themselves. Um, and then uh, I've got a couple of questions for you. Not too much audience participation. No interpretative dance or anything like that. I'm going to ask anybody to be doing. Um, and then we'll get going into the conversation. Unless anybody particularly wants to do that from an embodied point of view, that would be fine too. Pardon. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm excited to be here because... Um, well, when I started life in Greece as a young girl, I wanted to be an astronaut. And Douglas Adams actually kept a lot of that spirit alive. And I traveled the world and discovered worlds rather on this planet. Uh, but it's very exciting to think about how fantasy, science fiction, and technology, and art uh, come together in this. So I'm very glad to be here. And I have a towel with me, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm uh, Vali Lalioti. I'm uh, a designer, a computer scientist, and a professor of creative XR and robotics at the computer, uh, Creative Computing Institute at the University of the Arts right here in London. Um, I have always worked in that intersection between art and technology from 30 years ago when I was doing the first virtual reality systems in Germany to bringing and telling interactive stories about, uh, about apartheid during the Mandela presidency in South Africa to working at the BBC with first augmented reality technologies and now to creating the first creative robotics programs in the University of the Arts London. So looking forward to, to this panel and to have a fruitful conversation with you as well. Fantastic, thank you. Amazing. Um, gosh, I'm feeling incredibly intimidated by the people sitting next to me. Uh, um, how can I, uh, so 
I've, I, you know, since a kid, been drawing and sketching and imagining new worlds, really. Um, I, I suspect there's a few people in here that can kind of empathise with that. I, and just could, it can never switch it off. Just always need to be imagining the what if. Um, and I think I went through young years having this kind of equal balance between fascination with science and technology and, and engineering, but then equally just having this kind of uh, love of all artistic um, expression, really. And I think my parents were thinking, he's an architect, he's an architect. Um, so ended up uh, going into graphic design and, and communication design, and, and it was just at the moment when the, when the Macintosh was kind of coming through in a, in a big way was you know, very much a creative geek, threw myself into that, learned how to do um, animation and design through the computer very, very early on. And since then have gone on to uh, work in lots of different areas. We, we set up a friend, friend of mine and I set up a studio 14 years ago now called Territory Studio. Um, we've got offices all over the world and we are essentially there to look after other people like us. Um, just making, designing, animating, creating uh, new technologies, world building for films, for computer games, uh, live experiences, theme parks, just really finding things to keep us entertained and um, uh, interested. And uh, this subject is particularly important to us right now because um, this technology is coming through and it's questioning how we relate to our tools, how we relate to the things that we're doing, but also just as a narrative arc through so much of you know what we've what we've been looking at over the years. So, um, just very interested to see where this discussion goes. So am I. Um, thank you very much indeed. So uh, yes, I'm, I'm Robbie Robbie Stamp. Um, I sort of started my life as a historian um, and have done various things. I was deeply privileged to to start up a company with Douglas Adams in a dial-up world of the internet. It really was a dial-up world when we launched some of the products, modems went <laughs> that's sort of probably some there were some people recognise it, some people won't. Um, I exec produced the movie for Disney. Um, I know not everybody loved the movie, but the one thing I can assure everybody it was a labour of love from everybody who who, who made it uh, and was involved in it. Um, I do quite a lot of thinking these days about really trying to move towards a philosophy of AI. Again, trying to think about what is the relationship between and our embodied selves and how AI is manifest in the world. Um, the brief allusion to the AI Goosebumps Club. It's a club which we do thought experiments like, could an AI get goosebumps? Uh, could an AI be a member of the... Yes, I saw somebody in the, in the audience think, ah, could an AI get... Does it matter? Is it worthy of inquiry? I just did a wonderful event uh, just this week with 80 teenagers from around the world, um, Libya, Uzbekistan, all sorts of places, and we did three. We did, could an AI be superstitious? Could an AI be kind? And could an AI act in bad faith? And they're ways of exploring from first principles, really, who we are, what we are, words that we think we can use to describe how AI is manifest in the world and manifest in relationship. Words which we go, hmm. maybe, maybe, and words which you're going to probably not. Um, so... I'm going to start with a little parable of a puddle that Douglas Adams used to tell. And Douglas used to tell this story about a puddle that wakes up one morning and it looks around at the hole that it's in and it thinks to itself, this hole fits me very neatly. In fact, this hole fits me so neatly, it must have been made especially for me. And the puddle continues to believe that the hole that it's in was made especially for it as the sun comes up and the puddle evaporates. And I've always taken that to be Douglas's plea for a little bit hum more humility on behalf of sapiens in believing that we are the apogee of cognition, perception, and intelligence. And I think there's a very, very interesting, genuine inflection point in the history of sapiens, as at one end, we know more and more about mycelium networks and trees and animal intelligence and animal cognition. We're still exploring our own. We're exploring the role of our biome, the bacteria, the fungi with which every single one of us, there's no cost, no aspersions, have come into the room with. We've all got them. We've all, with this bacteria, something like 30, 40% of the DNA in our bodies is not ours. Our own embodiment and our own consciousness. And then this emergent thing 
AI. So today we're going to be thinking a lot about perspective, um, maybe with a bit more humility about where humans sit, and maybe critically, and I'm about to ask the first question, about where a certain kind of Western, empirical, Cartesian thinking about what it is to subsist and be in the world sits. So as we think about world building, the first question I wanted to ask was, was around your thinking around Japan, Shintoism, other ways of thinking about relationship and worlds, which are fairly directly relevant to, uh, to this thing about perspective and relationship. Yeah, thank you, Robbie. And I love the puddle that becomes conscious. And um, I want to touch upon, I work a lot with Japan because, of course, in terms of robotics, which is the area that I work in, they're quite advanced. And also, the way that they think about robots and the way they engage with robots is very different to the way we're thinking in the West. And that might be coming from Sintoism and animism, but it also comes from a, a manga and science fiction and their, their own way of actually growing up uh, with years of, um, of Astro Boy or what they call Atom Boy. This is a fantastic robot that it was made in the image of the son of the professor or the, the scientist back in 1952. So this is the way that the current uh, generations of AI and robotic scientists in Japan were brought up. And that interaction between the Atom Boy who is there to really support and uh, support humanity, talk about identity and also about um, discrimination. Uh, all these things are actually done through science fiction in, in Japan. So when you grow up with such a positive image of robots looking after you and being there not like something other, but actually like an alter ego, creates a different way of engaging with robots uh, in our day society in, in Japan. And you said very well that that might come from Sindhuism, uh, from this idea that we are not at the top of the pyramid, that maybe we are one with other human, non-human, and matter. And I link that always in my research with more Western philosophies that talk about post-humanism and new materialism. So looking at breaking that understanding that we are the top of the pyramid and the most intelligent species in, in, on the planet and looking at other things and trying to design robots as you know, entities that can be embodily intelligent like we are. That, that's fascinating and I, I, I'd like to, we were just briefly talking about how far back we can go in history mm. to people thinking about these relationships with these things that we create. Um, and you, you, you were talking about the Golem. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I didn't know about this. There's, there's a character called the Golem um, in Prague that uh, was seen as a, a guard, I guess, really, for a community there. Um, and I, you know, my, my, my early interpretations of IA definitely come from manga. Kind of, you know that like pop culture you can't you can't help but not see those things and then there's you know Blade Runner and all the rest of it but just this sense that um, it can be something that we're not suspicious of and that we are grateful for and maybe almost has a kind of parent child type relationship and are we okay to step down um, I feel very western culture in that respect I don't know if I do feel totally comfortable in Stepping down and and assuming and assuming a different position, but um, I think it's it's something that I keep thinking about at the moment when it comes to creation and um, and you know and and the, and the use of all of these things and and then the depiction of it is that um, we have to trust ourselves that the things that we're doing are to the benefit of us and can be beyond. Um, and that seems to be our, the biggest thing that we're pushing up against at the moment um, in my domain. Thank you. I said I would do... So I'm going to just ask a couple of questions now. Um, 
just the first is how, just this is a show of hands, how many people in the room have spent any time seriously engaging with one of the large language models, Claude or Anthropic or... Um, less than I would have expected. Dali, Mind Journey. Okay, again, some. Um, Sora, has anybody got their hands on Sora yet? The latest out of OpenAI and the videos. No. <laughs> no, I haven't yet. I, I, that, just to sort of get a, get a little bit of a sense. So the, other, the other question we wanted to ask was, um, and I'll, I'll repeat it so that you can just listen to us. How many of you think that AI will one day repurpose our atoms as an energy source to build silicon bridges to the stars. Um, so just, just how many of you have that view that we're doomed? Um, a show of hands that it's gonna build silicon, use us as an energy source to, to branch out into the stars. Oh good, so we haven't got too many of the ex existentialist threat people in the audience, because uh, that's, that's an, interesting sort of, an interesting space. I mean, this, we were talking about the language that people use around AI, particularly a lot of the language that comes out of Silicon Valley, and how deeply religious some of it feels when we, we, we talk about you know, this, this thing that will come and uh, it's almost like a vengeful Old Testament God. It'll come and smite us and smote us and smite us again and then send in the frogs. Um, we've been worrying about that an awfully long time. We've, we, we were saying that, I, again, probably most of you will know, but there's a reference in uh, Book 18 of, uh, of the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, um, when Thetis, Achilles' mum, goes looking for new armour for her boy Achilles because Patroclus has worn Achilles' armour as Achilles is sulking in his tent. And, uh, and so Hector has taken his armour, so Thetis needs new armour, and she goes to Hephaestus, the smithy of the gods. And there's a description there in book 18 of golden maidens with intelligence in their hearts who are operating completely independently within the workshop. So there in a, in a Bronze Age poem written down maybe for the first time in 700 BC, we've been thinking about the creatures we create for a very, very long time uh, and what they might come and do, uh, what they might come and do to us. And it's a very ancient thing. And again, in your, your travels, how much have you seen that, that, that deep, deep sense of time and then the, the way we tend to worry about the things that are going to come and overwhelm us? I'm very glad you brought Greeks into, into this. <laughs> uh, and, and the first automaton that we've made, I think, is one that serves wine. So not war. <laughs> um, but obviously any tool uh, in the history of humankind was used for entertainment as well as for killing each other. Uh, and uh, I don't think that uh, we're talking about the technology here. We're talking really about society, humanity is using technology and in which ways those technologies are used. And uh, uh, we can go prehistoric and think about tools that uh, were useful to survive, to eat and, and feed, but also used against each other. And uh, I challenge that that's not intelligent at all. So passing those kind of, of um, stories down and uh, biases into our systems is something that we are currently doing with AI, but we have done it in our history as, as humans, going a long way back. I try to be an optimistic person, so I'm sure that we can actually design robots and AI that can be a useful force in our societies. But this really depends on what kind of society we want to build so that we are purposefully doing that. And how do we educate, especially for me as a higher education um, a practitioner, how do we educate new talent to be able to maybe design things in a different way? Uh, and what I'd like to say is that the way to do that is to bring humanities, science fiction and technology together uh, in ways that are not following necessarily the Silicon Valley model, um, but maybe new ways of dealing with that through team entrepreneurship, who, through promoting you know, teams that work together across disciplines to create something which is... Um, may be beneficial to society. 
David, when you when you when you think about this this question of world building, I mean, you, you you've kind of got the imaginative world building. What what role do you see AI playing in in that? What ways do you think AI is going to start to be part of those explorations? How is it part of the process? Is it part of the process? Yeah, uh, I think it can be. I think you, we've all got that choice. I am. Um, I've always believed that the tools that you use actually shape some of what you do. And so if, if we, we, um, we've worked on films more recently where we've purposefully pushed the computer away for a little while and just worked into sketchbooks and traditional tools because actually it just gives you a completely different sense of creation and the ideas that come from it are different. And I think there's, there's something about... Your mind wandering through a book when you're or your mind wandering through a script and you're imagining the what if or the ideas are kind of springing from that it gives space to your mind to to, to build out those worlds and to to imagine those possibilities and sometimes the challenge with computers more generally or maybe these ai tools is they get you an answer very very quickly and they don't necessarily allow for that exploration or there's a tendency not to because it feels so immediate. I think we can use them in really interesting creative ways but I think at the moment we're allowing our creative process to be dictated by the tools rather than stating to the tools how we want to work and so it completely depends on how you, how you, how you interface with it. Um, I don't personally use ChatGPT um, for things because my writing is bad enough as it is that I need the practice, uh, I don't need to get any, any lazier with it. Um, and we're also really aware, I think, with large language models that um, it is an echo chamber. It's an, it's an average of the data that's in there. And often what's interesting for game designers or film directors is, is the things on the fringes. So if you're creating a medium, you're not really seeing the things on the fringes and the really the interesting things to push the discussion forward in a, in a meaningful way in storytelling. So I've, I've found that I'm interested in it and I love the idea of it, but I'm not always using it um, as my go-to tool. But I might test some things around the edges because it can get you there so quickly. Um, but, I, but I find that I'm still creating my best ideas with a bit of slow time, remote somewhere with a sketchbook and kind of exploring that way than being given immediate opportunities to see something, um, which is not necessarily useful to me when I'm, when I'm going through that process. But at different stages, you can dial it up and down. Mm. I think one of the things I've, I've been trying to do with, as I, as I, with my explorations is sort of hold two things, which is one, trying to think about, in a way, what is it that I'm encountering when I'm encountering a, a large language model, the one that I use is Claude in particular. What is the nature of the encounter? Um, and I, I was at a talk the other day and somebody who was, you know, had been involved in a technical way that I could never be in the, de the, the development of LLMs. And he said, oh, it's just a giant autocorrect. And I thought, it really, really isn't. That is such a, it's such a classic, sort of slightly techie dismissive thing to say. And just give you just give you an example. How, again, how many people know a book called The Glass Speed Game? Does anybody know The Glass Speed Game? Yeah, it is a bit of a generational thing I've found as well. This was a famous book in the uh, I read in my 20s by a man called Herman Hess. And so just very quickly, um, the conceit for the game is that you, you play a game on an abacus where you learn a symbolic language. And you play against another player. And so, for example... Um, if I was playing with Vali, I might lead with a piece of Bach music. And Vali would look at it and listen and think, oh, hang on a second, I see something in the maths of that music which reminds me of the ellipse patterns that the moons of Jupiter make mathematically. And I would play that, and Vali would play that in response, and you'd all go, ooh, that's beautiful. What a lovely, a lovely connection to make. So I, I've been playing the glass bead game with three large language models. And it's blown me away about the levels of creativity that is, and the last, it's not in the sense of it being an autocorrect. Nobody, so I played a famous poem, my favorite poem is called Liberty by Edward Thomas. And it's about the nature of human regret. And Thomas was severely bipolar, 
but it's a poem where he really lets himself off the hook at the end of the poem, very unusually, in the final stanza, when he's, he's talking about regret. And then he goes, but hey, you know what, that's what we do. We're human, we do this, we're messy creatures, that's what we do. So I, I led with Liberty. And the model responded with a piece of Brahms, Opus 118, which is said had a melancholy in it, uh, and then an uplift, which it sought reflected in the poem. So I then played Lady Dedlock from Bleak House, a character who is famously melancholy. And it played a black hole, because it said she's trapped in the own gra her gravity well of her own past. She cannot emerge above her own event horizon because of the marriage and the child she had out of, the, the child she had out of wedlock and out of her class. Now that is not an autocorrect. Nobody, no, that is not an autocorrect. It has not existed. So to suggest that it is an autocorrect is not being rigorous enough in thinking about what it is that you are encountering. So I'm going to ask a question again, if I might. If you were to come across two pieces of art, both, let's, let's call, we'll say they're both paintings, and you were moved by both of them, both of them in that moment of beholder's share moved you, there was something that grabbed you, if you were to discover one of them was by a human and one of them was by an AI, would you feel tricked by the AI encounter? How many people would feel tricked by the AI encounter? Did it somehow diminish that first? Tentative. Yeah, but it's, in, it, 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 it's interesting, isn't it? What, yeah. what, what, would your, what would your feel be? Would you, would you feel misled, tricked? So I'm, I'm, I'm really torn on the art thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use music in my, in my head. So often, I always have an appreciation for re recorded music. And, if, and if, it was, if, if, it was, if they were both recorded and I heard them back, and one was AI generated and one was by a person, and then I found out, would I feel tricked? No. But I would feel like the experience isn't, isn't going to go as far as it could do because I love then seeing that musician live and in person and understand their story and why they wrote that song and where that performance came from. So but to the first part of your question, I kind of, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with the, the, the rec recorded model, but I think you miss out on all the other parts of your um, connection to a creative piece of work um, beyond that. Because I think... And I, I certainly feel it when I'm when I'm starting to follow artists and others. I really buy into them because of their journey and their story, and and so much of what's going on behind that piece of work. It has so much more meaning once I know where that's come from. Um, even with you know films from Kubrick, you you see the you understand that attention to detail and that depth of world building, and you just you you have a next level of appreciation for how that has come to be. So um, I do agree with your point, but I, with caveats. Oh, I'm not, it was a question rather than... Rather than <laughs> yeah. Bally, what would your, what, what, what would your two response thoughts, be? Two yeah. thoughts about that, just uh, following from what you said. Is it then a matter of explicability? So if the AI could actually explain to you how it got there, and it could show you the copy and improve that it did, because a lot of painters, a lot of creative processes, copy and improve. Oh. <laughs> Would that, so I don't have an answer. I, I've, I've just as you spoke, I was thinking, and, and I don't think that there is a yes and no answer mm -hmm. to this, but we should consider that. Is, is it just a process or creative process? I'd like to think there is something more, uh, but what is it? And the, the other thing that comes to mind in, in this conversation for me is um, robots and uh, use of robots in care homes, especially care for dementia people. Um, there is, we know, maybe, maybe you have heard of Paro, the little robotic seal, how many? Maybe it's very common to have something that looks like a pet because when we pet it in places where we cannot have actual uh, dogs and, and real pets, it creates a sense of comfort, it creates an attachment and, and it relaxes uh, the person. And now my question is, would you be okay 
to say the white lie that this cat is actually a real cat because a dementia patient cannot tell whether it is or it is not. So research shows that actually some of that connection, they believe it is a, a, real, a real animal. So in a very similar way, just taking your metaphor from art and bringing it into our homes and the society we currently have. So is that ethical? Is that something we should create? Because care for dementia is a lot of white lies anyway. It's a great question. Again, let's ask it. So who, who, who would find the seal if it was, I'm not, I'm not trying to lead the audience here, providing some solace, some genuine comfort, who, who would say, yes, that was appropriate, and who would say, no, it wasn't? So look, just again, look around in the audience as well, because it's nice for you all to get a sense of sort of broadly what you're thinking. It's very interesting how you're kind of, it's, there's pretty much even splits on, on all of these things. Um, it's that, 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 that relation, I think this is something also that really worth thinking about. A slight different spin, as we were talking about in the green room before we came on, a different spin on world building in a way, I suppose, that we're moving towards, which is what is the world we want to build with AI? How intentional do we want to be about what's happening in this emerging relationship? So I'll, I'll, I'll ask another quick one, if, I'm, if I may, which is a grief bot. So um, I gave a talk some years ago, a TEDx talk, about uh, an experience I'd had with Douglas Adams long after he died, when a, uh, I was asked to be on a show where the idea was you were going to be in conversation with Douglas Adams' archive. And the other people were going to do it. Mary, there was Mary Whitehouse, Derek Jarman, um, uh, Malcolm X. And anyway, the Douglas' family said, look, they didn't want to do it, but if I did, it very much had their blessing. So the producer arrived with about 80 hours of archive material. And uh, I said, well, the, the theme I'd like to pick through is this theme of perspective, that back to the puddle, Douglas's fascination with what if and perspective. So we'd went through that, and at the end of the experience, the, the producer said, what, what did I feel? And I said, well, I felt a strange moments of connection, but I also felt a huge renewed sense of absence and loss, because Douglas wasn't there to hug. And he was a very big huggy guy. He, was a, he liked his red wine and his margaritas and his champagne, and he was immensely good company. So it led me to being asked to do a TEDx talk about grief bots. So if there was a really pretty sophisticated way with face and voice of being able to talk to a deceased relative, these things are out there now, how many of you would consider using one of those things? Okay, that's a smaller number. It's a smaller number. Again, this, this relational space you were talking about, Shintoism, what, 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 would, you, what, would, your, what would your view on that be? Would you, would you say yes, bring it on? I would say yes. And why? Um, because I would love to be able to phone, have a phone call to my dad or my mum. Mm. Yes. And, and probably I will end up with feeling even the bigger grief. But that's human, isn't it? Mm. Mm. It's... it's David, what would you what would your thought be? Oh, um, no. I, uh, so on a personal level, it was somebody I knew and I was really close to. No, because mm. I need to go through that grief. Mm. Um, but I'd be fascinated by famous people. Mm -hmm. Is it wrong to say that? No, not at all. No, no. I think that would be. I think that would be fascinating. But yeah, I think I, I think I know that I need to go through that grief, and I and I worry that. You know, and and I, I have I have seen Silicon Valley projects that that suggest a, a download of consciousness on a personal mobile level, um, where the person can live on through 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 AI, and um, it's not for me. It's interesting. It's about that 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 consciousness and live on phrase there, because again, back to the Goosebumps Club, back to thinking about. Um, and for the philosophers in, here in the room, the, 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 one of the underlying things here is, is Wittgenstein's concept of family resemblance. So Wittgenstein talked about, his famous thing was games. I, I think actually he meant before computer games, because obviously he was writing for computer games. There's kind of no one rule that is there in every single game, but there's a family of things which all resemble each other, which have that category. And when we think about these words about, yes, you can use that word without breaking its meaning, to describe AI. 
no, you can't, and in the middle. So let's take an example, a word like authority, for example. You know, it's clear that there are lots of occasions in our life, bank loans, et cetera, et cetera, where an, an AI is effectively wielding authority over us. And I don't think we break the meaning of the word. A word like empathy, for example, can, and can it empathise with you? You can have a conversation with. But a word like be accountable, I think, is meaningless because you cannot sanction an AI. And there is no normative social system of ethics where we don't have a way of punishing bad actors. Whether it's the extreme of, you know, in history, pain of death or banishment from your tribe or now the social emotions of shame, guilt, remorse. And, of course, one of Douglas's famous creations was Marvin the Paranoid Android. And would you want an AI driving your kid to school in a driverless car which was having a bit of a bad day and thinking, well, shall I just go through this traffic light? I don't know, is, it, is, it, is, is, is life really worth it after all? So that, that, that living on question, I, the, the reason for just that little preamble and context there was the word live. I'd like to explore that a bit more, that, that idea of is that a word we can use as we start to think about different ways we might persist into the future now, which are different from persisting in voice recordings, on video, on film, in texts, our memoirs, our letters, um, that's showing my age, proper old letters written with pens and things. Do you, do you, do you think that, that the, 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 the live word, I'll come to Valley first on that, that that's a word we could use to think about describing how we will digitally persist? Can I talk about the life of robots in Japan? Mm -hmm. Because Japanese actually have a farewell ceremony, like a funeral for robots that are out of service. Okay. Um, have you been to one? Uh, no, uh. but I've been to a temple where the, the priest, uh, the Buddhist priest was a robot, and he was explaining oh, yeah. Buddhism. I've seen that. Yes. Oh, wow. You've actually been it's there. It's from a professor, a famous professor in, uh, in, in doing humanoid robots. And um, when I talk about robots, I don't only talk, I actually talk mostly about non-humanoid robots, but um, there is one that is a priest in Japan. I, I don't know any other religion that that would have been accepted or entertained even. But life... Life is a different story because in our society, what is alive? You talked about the battle. If our philosophy, who many here might be thinking about new materialism, might be a, a better way to actually live in the ecosystem together with our you minerals. Just to explain new materialism. New materialism is looking at um, matter and its vibrant connection to us, spaces affect us, affects our mood, they affect the way we live. Minerals are one and the same with us. You talked about mushrooms and their, their circles. We are not um, us and them. They are not the other. As long as we can accept that we live in the same kind of material world and we have vibrant relationships with them, then we start reframing the life that we live in in certain in, in a different way, which hopefully will make us actually being better for the planet and kinder for our species and other species. So going back to your question was about life, and you asked me whether life we it's, can actually think of what AI. Do think, what do we think? Yes, this word that life and, and, and living on that 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 language and that of I because you raised it, so I'm coming back to you in a mm. second on it as well. Um, and I would say, who would control how I continue in life? And uh, I'd like to be able to control that. For me, that's the, the big question is, uh, who is actually um, allowing me to be going forward? That's a, I, Microsoft tried to patent the capacity to do that. They tried to patent the idea of some form of digital ancestor. So you imagine that you know, you're Microsoft and you, you've created a digital ancestor. 
you know, through text messages, voice, etc., who you d are finding some solace in. And you get a, you, 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 Microsoft wanted one day to be able to send you a letter saying, no, you can't talk to your grandpa. You're infringing our patent. Um, your, your grandpa who exists in another kind of digital space, and I'm going to come back to this question about what does it mean to be manifest in data space in a second. May but David, I can I just, 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 David, sure. just quickly, because yeah. you, you, you asked a question and then absolute value, we'll come back to you. Thanks. Yeah, so, um, well, I, I mean, we need, to, we need to differentiate between AI and large language models mm -hmm. for a second because large language models are uh, uh, created as a pattern recognition and that system is kind of closed in a way. It exists, it will develop further with the aid of AI, but it cannot, it cannot exist. So if we load our intelligence into a large language model, that is a frozen point in time, mm -hmm. so we are we are frozen. However, if we use AI, then that person, that intelligence could develop further beyond on a trajectory and evolve. And so there's two different types of a living on there almost. There's a, there's a version of us frozen, or there's a, there's a version of us that goes on beyond us. They, I mean, my brain's about to go into meltdown now. Um, <laughs> But I, but I feel as but I feel as though I'm more comfortable personally with the idea that if if something is dynamic and it can live on and it's adapting to its surroundings, then it feels more authentic to our experience of the world. Then I would be okay with that. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Valley, you were going to following up actually from that is this idea that we live up here. And I'm going to challenge that because there is a lot of computational power that is happening in our bodies. And that's why I'm talking about embodied intelligence. So your, our knees, our joints, they have computational power that doesn't go to the brain. It can do it automatically within the way that the structures work. And that's how we walk. And that's how we, we do a lot of things. And part of who we are is because we live in the particular body that we have. I happen to be female. That is a lived experience that is very different to the two people that are sitting next to me. Um, so this idea that somehow my consciousness will go into something ethereal in the cloud and it will be me uh, without a body, without the lived experience that I have in my height and my joints and the way that my wrist moves when I do art. Um, for me, that's not me. I think, I think this is very profound because I think it goes to some of those questions we were having about the discourse around intelligence mm -hmm. and what it means to know. So, for example, there's a, there's a strand of, of, of journalistic reporting and indeed some Silicon Valley discourse. And I want to say some of my best friends, etc. I don't want to keep bashing Silicon Valley. Um, I read an article, for example, which was talking about AI and omniscience. AI and omniscience. So that's a huge claim, an enormous claim, and it's one, you know, as things to ponder on after today. Let's give you just one example of how, well, I think it will we'll come to some of the issues around bias and what, what we mean by knowledge and intelligence. So if you imagine an Aboriginal woman walking the song lines in Australia, these are, these are things which probably some of you know. These are songs that are passed down through generations which allow both men and women from different clans to navigate across different territories, literally singing the landscape as they go. So you imagine a woman who's singing the landscape as she goes with a level of embodied sense-making and feeling and intelligence in every step that she takes. Digitize that. So when you make a claim about omniscience, as some Silicon Valley gurus will do, you've got to say, well, either they've got to say, well, when I said omniscience, I don't actually mean omniscience. I don't mean I didn't need to know. So then you're into a hierarchy of whose knowledge counts, whose knowledge systems count, and whose knowledge systems don't count in this space and in this world, and who's driving those discourses about intelligence and knowledge. And that's a really, I think it's really, really important um, when, we, when we think about what it means to know. And again, the, a really important point, David, you were making, this idea 
the, the implication of it becoming omniscient is that knowledge is somehow this static thing. That one day it's like an oil well. You know, you can put a probe in there and go, ta-da, the AI now knows everything. You've seen it written. Knows everything that humans have ever known. Well, you go, hang on a second. For each and every one of us sitting in this room today, it's feeling us, our bodies, the weight, the weight on the chairs, hearing the slight hum of the air conditioning, listen to us talk, some of it landing, some of it not landing. In your brains right now, the darkness of your brain pan, with your eyes and your ears and your sense of taste and touch and everything, a magical, mystical thing has happened. That knowledge is, your, each one of you would have reached back in space and time to sensations, thoughts, memories. All sorts of things would have happened and been laid down, neuronically, in every single one of these brains sitting in this room, which leaves us an irreducible mystery. It leaves us irreducibly mysterious. So I'm absolutely not a reductionist. I think reductionism, I have a hoodie, the geekiest thing I've ever done, which said reductionism is epistemic arrogance. Um, and and, it, and, and, it, and it, it's, 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 it's deeply to that point. And, and Valley was talking about bias and the way in which these models are created and this, this profound issues around whose knowledge systems, what knowledge counts, what knowledge is discounted. Um, and then we're going to get on to the phenomenology of AI. Um, because that's deeply relevant for robotics. But I, just th that response to those thoughts. Yeah, it was one example that, you know, open AI, uh, nothing, I mean, any AI would have done the same, so I'm not against one or the other. And uh, you say, going back to astronaut, and you say, I want to have a film of a 30-year-old astronaut uh, walking down a planet with a woven uh, helmet. And, of course, the astronaut that... A fantastic film coming out of that, the astronaut is white male. So is this the bias in our systems? Is this the bias of our society? Is it that we don't have enough female astronauts out there or black astronauts for, for that purpose? So that's my comment on this. Can I just, are there, are there any organizers in the room? Because I was told we had an hour and 15 um, when we started. But I see that my clock has been ticking down to any given me an hour. So I'm also aware of, of questions. Um, just, just so we'll, we'll, we'll keep going before we... I just want to make sure we go to questions as well. Um, um, whether or not we've got only 12 minutes or whether we've got slightly longer. You've got slightly longer. We've got, we have got slightly longer. Yeah, so it's set on it. Thank you very much, Neil. I thought we did. I just, just wanted to double check. Thank you. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking actually about systems and bias and knowledge and whose who's forms of knowledge and that very interesting question you raised about being frozen in time, so the idea that your knowledge yourself got frozen at a moment of knowledge yep. as opposed to what you were saying, what you like is knowledge and it's evolving Yeah, well, I think messiness. that's <laughs> my, actually my... My response is probably a good example. So memory is an important thing here, and also lack of. Mm -hmm. So so we forget things. You're talking about the person walking, you know, through the environment. Um, we don't lock all of that in, or it's not immediately accessible. Um, and that's okay, because that motivates more learning and more engagement with the environment and interest. Um, and, I, and I think that... Uh, uh, you know, if I think about uh, our intelligence, artificial intelligence, I think one is, we need to be okay with it. It is completely different. It doesn't need to replicate what we have. Um, we need to be comfortable with it, with it being something else. It's all there. It's all immediate. We cannot be that, and neither should we want to be. Mm -hmm. Actually, not having all the information just ensures that we keep on asking all the questions. And I think that's what we're wonderful at, is keep on asking really interesting questions and, and searching out. Um, I don't know if a system that can just access everything would, would, have, would have that there. Um, and I certainly know that some of my happiest friends are the ones that know the least. So I, I suspect that there's, <laughs> should, we, don't, we don't need to chase after those things and, and we can rely um, differently on some of those other systems, in my mind. I want to push a little bit at this, um, the, the, particularly the robotics side of things. Um, so phenomenology, 
being, again, forgive me, for, for, the, for basically the study of experience, how we experience our world as opposed to value ethics um, or metaphysics, you know, the, the ultimate nature of reality. So again, if we think about our bodies, our, what, our sensory motors, our, our, our eyes, our, our touch, our taste, our memory, which is the way we, we process data around us. If we start to imagine robots as a form of a form of embodied AI, a form of, of AI which is moving in 3D space in ways in which, with maybe other sensory motors, you know, tight, the capacity to see things at an atomic level or, you know, a mole tiny molecular level, detect sounds that we can't. Do you think there's something, and it's, genu it's not a leading question, it's genuinely a question, do you think there's something in, in that, other forms of intelligence and sense making when it, it's not just ingesting that kind of written data, it's ingesting all sorts of other forms of data, some of which are opaque to us, some of which we, we in our perceptual frames can't access. Hmm. That's a very difficult question. <laughs> we can imagine, okay, um, if you think of the robots that exist currently, um, yes, they move, There's, yes, they sense the world, and when I say robots like this, I think humanoids or a Boston Dynamic dogs, you know, um, but also think of other robots that maybe you're wearing, maybe they are softer, and those examples exist. So what, they see the world in a different eye. And what do we mean by seeing? Uh, yes, of course, robots see very differently to us. So, for example, um, you could uh, have eyes in a similar way, have two cameras here, but you can also have a camera that the robot has access to, which means that all of a sudden I see myself and I see myself from afar, from above, and at the same time, I see the whole world in front of me, including myself, which as a human, I can't. I, I wish I was the, you know, a fly on the wall, but um, that's just imagination that takes me there. For a robot, it's reality, uh, because it's data that it can be absorbed and can be done uh, quickly. So an example of that is that you cannot, in, uh, again in Japan, sorry for bringing Japan there, but they are more advanced than we are in the UK and that gap we need to fill up. But um, you cannot play the um, rock, scissors, paper uh, game because the robot actually sees so much faster that there is absolutely no way to win because they know just by your movement what you're going to do and they can quickly do you know, something that wins. So yes, they do. And, and uh, one important thing when, like me, you do research in, uh, in robotics, we very rarely research the machine. We actually research humans. It's, it's all about research, a human experience. And maybe we'll find different ways of existence because of that. It's one of the it's it's the it's one of the themes in Douglas's work really is Douglas Adams work is about perspective and he's on he's on record as saying that the whole import of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is that every species in the galaxy feels they're more central to the story than they actually are, um, and I think this is David one of the things that strikes me about this conversation that's then interesting mm -hmm. is one of the one of the things is the why do we worry in the end about silicon bridges to the stars. It's because we worry about forms of agency evolving with these things. So not only are they, do they take data, so they come, there's a, a, an AI which is advisory, and it mm. comes back to you and say, how about this world, how about this design? And you go, yeah, maybe, maybe not. But then there's the step where it actually is able to act in the world as a result of, its, of, the, of the data that it has ingested, and it makes something happen, it causes something to happen in the world. Yeah, damn it. <laughs> I think you might have changed my mind slightly on stage as we've been talking a lot. Um, there was one thing that you said about this idea that a tiny robot could sense things, see things that otherwise couldn't, and play that back. And going back to the idea of art, ultimately the idea of art is to help people see the world in different ways, and the same with science and everything else. It's, so the question that's running through my head that's probably not going to get out of it now, thanks very much, is... Um, 
it, it can it can maybe not feel and it can't understand the emotions it's made you feel, but it could absolutely create a piece of art or something that helps you see the world in a different way and feel a different way, and that would still be relevant art. Mm. Mm. It, it, it achieves it without understanding it for itself, mm. and that's okay, and I would be all right with that. And I think this gets into a really interesting thing about seeming and being, you know, how much it will matter whether it's, it's being empathetic or whether it is seeming to be empathetic, mm. and does the distinction matter? And when I, when I do that thought experiment of the Goosebumps Club, most groups end up saying, if it's being kind to you, yes, you're being empathised with. No, it's not being empathetic, because it doesn't feel it in its tummy. But I have a friend who, by his own description, is very high-functioning on the spectrum, and he said, I don't really feel empathy, but I've taught myself to spot the social signals when it's expected of me, so am I not being empathetic? And, and I think that's one of the things about thinking about blurrier boundaries that has been one of the themes. So keeping to time, knowing I think we do then, I think we've got about that 20 minutes for questions. Um, we'll take some first questions from the audience if anybody's got any. Uh, there's a lady down the front, so some down the front, sorry, I, I, forgive me if I get pronouns or anything wrong today. It's, it's still, I haven't quite found the way of doing that yet <laughs> without knowing somebody, so forgive me if, I, if I've got that wrong. I apologise. Yeah. So on the subject of AI and existential threat, it's almost as though it's become a different kind of existential threat than we thought it was going to be. It's sort of not Skynet, it's the cotton mills over again, if you see what I mean. It's, it's, it's not Skynet, it's... The cotton mills. Right. It's work that had been creative and that was a way of life and that people sort of relied on is being transformed into a format which means it can only profit a very few people. Mm -hmm. And so... While it won't necessarily sort of Skynet murder everyone, it will sort of, in a lot of different ways, make a lot of people's lives just a little bit worse in ways that, I don't know, technology advancing that doesn't benefit people, but somehow takes control of society anyway. That's a good starter for a, 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 a question. And, and, uh, and uh, so would either of you like to take that first? Uh, yes, I, I can talk. Uh, I'm just back from a critical robotics uh, workshop in, in Sweden just last week. And um, I think that's a very important um, issue. It's a huge issue. It's a big issue. And uh, to me as an educator and also in what we're doing in the Creative Computing Institute, talking about ethics, opening up those conversations, being able to see that this technology is, is also, is, it's not technology per se, it's actually within a socio-economic and cultural world that we are living. Um, so unless we educate people to a, understand what the impact is, we, we have a possibility to debate the ethics around it, and we are able to have technologies that are understanding art, they understand uh, design, and together with computing and programming these things, we're not going to develop the right systems. So yes, there is, there is a, a concern and we all share that concern and what we need to do is to actually make sure that the talent that is out there and able to develop the next AI systems and produce the next robots has absolutely an understanding that they are not just pushing technology they're actually creating a world. And I think this conversation is about creating worlds. So we have to really educate ourselves, understand how these technologies work, and educate younger people to maybe deliver a better world. It's a lot to, to hold on to the, older pe the younger people, but... David. Um, well, we've got busier since the invention of AI. Um, because lots of brands are really interested in what, uh, what what an AI character looks like and behaves like, and there's lots of design and animation and exploration to go on around that. Um, I would say that it reminds me that, uh, not to romanticise it, and this is not so trying to sidestep your question, but I do think there's similarities between when photography came along and what fine artists had to do in terms of the way that they looked at their own profession. Up until that point, they were really trying to recreate reality. Photography came in and said, I can kind of do that a little bit better. Um, 
and then you kind of get the explosion of impressionism and post you know modernism and, and everything else that kind of goes from that so i think it just it changes the question on our relationship to the work and i think that's a good question i think if we're if we're thinking about what we add as creators then um that's that's exactly what we should what we should be doing and i think we also overestimate how good these tools are um, and we we still need our own ability to creatively direct a project and t and as tastemakers it's still huge so some of the creative endeavors that maybe are repeatable i think ai will probably you know cotton cotton mills example that probably is fair but it should hopefully, and what I'm seeing is really free up time for the stuff we really enjoy, and which is originating and, and building out things that have, you know, really touch an audience, really emotionally connect. So I'm, I'm seeing it as an ability for us to just be doing more of the things that we want to be doing. Um, but I'm really hoping that's not a utopian view. No, it's really, it's a, it's a great question. And I mean, the, the, it's a, the Cotton Mills question is, you know, from... The existence of the cotton mills, for example, a, a lot of places in the global south where people do all the data labelling, for example, um, you know, which sit, un, sit underneath a lot of these models, they are pretty difficult places already. And I think that, that, that depends on the time frame one puts on these things. There's kind of, you know, there's a, there's a, there was a famous poem by Brodkin in the 60s called, you know, watched over, or watched over by machines of loving grace which was a sort of quite a nice 60s idea that, you know, these things would free us up from labour, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the repetitive labour um, uh, of, 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 you know, work in fields and hard labour. Um, and we'd sort of be able to frolic like bunnies in, in fields all the time. I, I worry genuinely about this question because I think that the inroads this stuff is going to make on human work um, you know, if you if you think now about you know number of relatively highly paid jobs, you take something which sounds slightly dull. Are there any actuaries in the room? No, I didn't think so. But just just you know, um, if you take a firm which currently employs a thousand actuaries to do risk assessments, you just will not need a thousand actuaries. You'll need a hundred really really good human shepherds, really you know smart. You'll maybe have. 50 people in support roles and maybe 100 jobs which we haven't envisaged yet but it leaves 800 people you just will not need now what the time scale is i don't know i mean we're, i'm not saying it's happening next year but it's already started to have impacts on I mean, duolingo for example let a lot of you know the translation service so i i I, I have yet, in all honesty, it's a great first question, I've yet to be at any of these discussions where I've heard a genuinely convincing response to what is going to happen with all of this stuff. And I think all one can say is that, bearing that in mind, you know, robots don't pay taxes. Our, our entire economic systems are structured on humans doing work and paying taxes. Now, when you, when you throw in demographics, just to sort of keep it cheery, when you, when you throw in, you know, the demographic collapse, ageing populations, which I think we will also, even for the youngest in the room, I think will still be a cusp generation. I certainly am. You know, a number of complex, chronic health problems which we increasingly have as we get older because we're staying alive but not necessarily desperately healthily. So we're, we're, we're not going to be the beneficiaries of AI and bioengineering and technology yet. So I think, I think this is really, and I think worrying about it, what it means in terms of policy, who's excluded, where does AI reinforce existing power structures and exist, exacerbating exacerbate existing power inequalities is a really fundamental question. So I'm very, thank you very much for asking because we've stayed on the creative side and, and not so much on the social side. And, and as I say, I'm, I'm yet UBI, universal. What, just one other thing. I saw Sam Altman the other day. I'm doing my Silicon Valley bashing, aren't I? You know, talking about how fabulous it'll be because AI will reduce, reduce work. You never hear that from somebody who thinks, I'll be doing that. It'll be other people who do that. You know, tell that to a 16-year-old in Hull right now that actually work is not all it's cracked up to be. You don't find meaning from work. 
You, yeah, it's fine if you're an extremely well-heeled, wealthy person in retirement, but it, it's a really profound. So thank you very much indeed. Any other questions? Uh, oh goodness, loads and loads. Um, the lady in the front here, the um, so I've gone green hair, pink hair. So that's perfect. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks. It was so interesting to hear uh, more of a positive talk on the potentials of AI because I'm from, um, an, so I'm an oral history and folklore researcher, so I'm very much arts and humanities. And in my field, there is almost what I think is like a borderline hysteria about how much AI is going to totally compromise research integrity. Um, there's like a huge fear over deep fakes for oral history interviews, for, um, for folk creation. And I just wanted really to kind of get some of your takes on whether you think that's like a legitimate fear, whether it's come from sort of a lack of understanding because it is an, a STEM perspective, not to diminish my arts and humanities colleagues, but, um, and would you consider AI created folklore and oral histories to be legitimate in some way for research? Do you think it could open the door for like an interdisciplinary approach? Sorry, that's like probably no, it's another fabulous three question. different questions. No, 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 no. It, and well, sorry, super it, selfish, because it's, it's not. Well, let's do, <laughs> let's, let's take, well, um, uh, okay. go ahead. Uh, would you want to answer? No, 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 one? please go ahead. Um, the, we're going back into all our worries, right? Because um, as I think, Robbie, very well you said before, we worry about a lot of things around that, you know, and, and mostly I worry more about the power structures, I, I worry more about the biases rather than whether we're going to be creative and how we're going to be creative in, with it. Uh, when it comes to research, there's just so many articles now that they incorporate mistakes that happen through actually tapping into chat GPT. And uh, it's clear that we have to change something in the way the academic research is, is happening and is validated. And for those that you do not uh, you know, follow academic research quite as closely maybe as, as uh, you, you've asked obviously the question, um, when, when you go and you search and then ChatGPT gives you some summary of, of uh, data that, that actually is not accurate then that creeps into academic papers and then it can be replicated. So it's a, it's a real issue. And there are, but there are even more worrying things around, uh, you know, the, the, the powers and the loss of jobs, the, the sort of how do we shift skill, skills and, and educate people to really manage that new sort of shift that is happening in, in jobs that I am really more... Um, concerned about and I do believe that when we do this multidisciplinary mix between you know social science art and technology we added a better world to address those issues and I think that's as far as I can go to a solution. David I was going to um, um, deep fakes <laughs> mm. you know. Uh, so yeah I mean going to some of your questions that uh, I think we 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 have a human problem in that we think it's really great this technology <laughs> Uh, and that um, it knows exactly what it's doing. It doesn't. This is completely interpretive. The way it's working, it, you know, it's like me working with somebody else and saying, give me, your, you know, give me your answer on X, Y, and Z. It will look at all of this stuff and give you an average answer based on everything it sees out there. So we, need, we just need to remember that it's a systems interpretation, and that is purely it. It's not... It's not there yet and it's not giving us all the right answers and we need to treat it as such um, so I, yeah for me it's it's more about the the amount of trust we put in it for factual um, information coming back because I remember examples of you know asking it what's two plus two and it says five because it's looked at all the answers out everywhere and the average of all the bad answers and all the right ones is five and and I, and I, I so I, I think there's just yeah just us just being realistic around, you know, it's it's great as a tool and it has a purpose, but we can't we can't fully. Um, and I think the other thing that I'm seeing coming through from Silicon Valley and some of the projects we're working across is the reverse of generative. And the reverse of generative is attribution. 
and there are systems coming through soon that will say that's a generative piece of content and just so you know only that bit and that bit are 70% accurate the rest of it is utter nonsense and has come from this source and so I think I think we are making our narratives on how this technology is being used based on what we're being sold right now I think there are further developments not too far away hopefully I haven't broken any NDAs um, that, that, that kind of just just allow us to see this clearly for what it is. But I think, you know, generative especially is, um, it, it needs to be treated with care. Super, thank you. We'll try and get some more questions in. Can we just take a question from online, please? Uh, yes, of course. Brilliant. I've got a question from MJ. AI and machine learning mechanisms are built on limited material resources. Circuit boards, cooling mechanisms, fuel, electricity. Accessing these valuable resources requires power, influence, and a lot of money. Or do we need to ask ourselves who gets to decide whose creativity is worth the investment and whose isn't? We've got four minutes left. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so let, we'll try and keep our answers relatively, your turn? Uh, relative, relatively <laughs> brief. Um, Okay, just very quickly then, and then very quickly, and then we'll try and get one more question in from from the room. Yeah, uh, power. I mean, right from the raw power, the you know the you know requires the energy that, that to power Belgium to be powering these things at the moment. I mean, there's an enormous there, you know, just the actual energy power. But again, it's back to this discourse about. I mean, I think one of the things is interesting. Who's the big dog that hasn't barked in AI yet? And it's Apple. Um, and I think that, 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 that there's, there's a, I've been tracking this a little bit, there's edge, edge AI, edge computing, which is going to actually distribute a lot of the power that we're currently seeing sitting in these models to the edges to make, and I, I was at a, a, a fringe event around Synax, slightly bizarre, I mean, I've got to say, what, how bizarre was Synax interviewing Elon Musk as an experience, I mean, what a surreal experience to watch a Prime Minister fawning over Elon Musk like that. But it was an AI, AI, AI summit, and it was um, very interesting people from the global south talking about the deployment of these technologies in healthcare settings and medical settings. So I, I do think that, that there is a chance that these technologies do get distributed to allow more, more access. Uh, in fact, I, I think it's not game over as far as that's concerned. Uh, but you know some of the discourse questions that we've been we, we've been having are maybe we'll 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 leave it at that for now and let's take another question. In. But a great question, thank you, MJ. It was a great question. Um, because a gentleman in, in the front here with the beard. Sorry, there's so many hands. I apologise. Give you keep it reasonably brief. I'll do my best. So it's about creativity mainly, and uh, I, I've played uh, quite a bit with uh, generative art uh, softwares. And, and you are right, I, I do think there are significant limitations, in particular in terms of process and setting up a strategy. What I'm thinking is that sometimes I have this doubt in my mind, are we uh, overvaluating human creativity sometimes, a little bit? And what I mean by that is that, you know, I work quite, quite a bit in films, etc. A lot of the things that we do, they are not particularly creative. That's my, there is a lot of, uh, Repetition, you know the. Right. Got the question. Yes, that's, I, that's really no. It's great. You know, do yes. we overrate human creativity sometimes? That's a great. Just question. sometimes. Yes, yeah, so sometimes. Absolutely. Um, Valley, and then and then David. I and thought then. David. Yeah, me first. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need to come and speak to my team. They they'd love this. Um, uh, I. Yes, I think, yeah, I think we do overrate human creativity. And I think that, that that goes back to my point, you know, the photography and the impressionism thing. It's just, I feel like AI is actually asking all the right questions of us. You know, what are we putting our energy into? What do we value as creativity? Like, you know, that as a term is a little bit too broad. And, and what are we really are talking about there? I think so many creative people are so passionate and love what they're doing that this has kind of rattled their, their reason for doing this a little bit. And um, I think, give us a couple more years and we step back from all of this, things have settled. Um, but yes, I think you're right. I think we do, we do over-index on that stuff sometimes. And um, 
it's quite a good moment to kind of reflect on that and, and look back. back Jeff, thank you. Funny. Yeah, I, I would say human intelligence is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in that uh, hierarchical model where we are at the top and uh, all other species are not as intelligent, we are losing the ability to be critical of ourselves. And that's why we think AI is so, so intelligent, because we made it, or that robots are so intelligent. And the truth is, they are not, and they are very fragile, just like human beings. I'm going to leave you with, with one thought, which um, thank you both so much, which goes back to the puddle. Um, and it's this idea, which I think sits at the heart of Douglas, which is this idea of radical humility. And I think what, 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 what ra radical humility, and I think what, what we, we have, as you can see in today's conversation, is a chance to really think deeply about where we sit in the great big scheme of things and with a little bit more humility about believing we are the apogee of cognition and perception and intelligence. So here's the great moral, political, philosophical challenge of the era, one of them. How do we both celebrate ourselves at our most constructive and special and get over ourselves at the same time? How do we hold that paradox politically, philosophically, in the systems we create and how we interact with each other personally? How do we celebrate ourselves and get over ourselves at the same time? And I'm finishing on with 42 seconds to go, which for anybody who knows, hitchhikers is deeply auspicious. <laughs> so I will say thank you very much for your time. Thank you.